Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could all stand. Uh, on the way to church, I was just thinking about what pastor spoke on last night. It was, Lord, send the fire. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what he spoke about and how we said, let's start revival last night. Well, revival is not just a yearly event. We don't just do this because we love the Bryans, even though we do love the Bryans. Uh, we do this because we need renewed. We do this because we get spiritually tired, just like emotionally tired and physically tired. And tonight, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm spiritually tired. There's been some stuff going on that I'm just tired. And so I come here tonight not just because it's the event that we come to. I come here tonight to get renewed. I come here tonight to feel that. So if we could just start this service off and say, God, I'm here to get renewed. I'm here to be filled. Rather be 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight, feeling the presence of God? Amen. The Holy Ghost moving like he is right now. Hallelujah. If we can't come, and I know that you did with an expectation that God is going to perform the miraculous, uh, that God is going to move, uh, that God is going to meet and supply the need that you and I have. Hallelujah. He's going to meet us at the point of need in our lives. Uh, do you believe that tonight? Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord and thank him for that. Praise God. Amen. We uh, are going to make our needs known tonight. Several are here listed on the prayer list for a uh, physical healing. Sister Birchfield and uh, Sue Duncan, Arlene and Jack Rhodes, uh, and Vicki, uh, Diane Bonecutter, and Braley Newell. These all need a physical touch, a healing. Amen. Perhaps a miracle, but I know a God that's able. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know a God that is able. There's nothing too big for that God cannot do, and there's nothing so small that's insignificant in the sight of God. Why? Amen. God cares about you. God cares about me. Amen. And what we're going through and what we face in life. So let's remember these uh, for a physical healing, a physical touch. Uh, there are some unspoken listed here on the prayer list. And uh, if you have an unspoken request, just raise your hand right now. God knows all about that situation. Uh, amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer knowing uh, that He is a prayer answering God. Uh, knowing that He has all power in heaven and in earth. Uh, hallelujah. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Brother Weddle, if you would uh, take this list. Amen. Pray over this request. like for our ushers to come at this time. I want to give all of us the opportunity to bless the Lord and invest in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We know, amen, that God is going to bless these funds that are given tonight. We're going to receive an offering. Amen. So, Brother Brent, if you would pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon this offering. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, in your mighty name. God, we exalt you. We glorify you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, God, you're great and greatly be praised. Nobody like unto you, oh, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask you to pray with me if you would. Uh, I've mentioned over the past uh, two or three services, uh, our superintendent, Brother Hurley, his daughter, um, Miranda, is expecting. And they have a doctor's appointment tomorrow uh, in regard to the baby. And if that doctor's appointment goes well on Monday, they will be doing surgery uh, in utero on the baby. Uh, the, the baby's uh, organs have pushed up, has crowded the lungs. The lungs are not developing. And, and so they've got to go in, and I don't understand. They, they explain to me at odd. I, I just I don't understand what they're going to do, but uh, we need to pray. And ask God to be with them. Tomorrow has to be a good appointment. It, it has to be a good appointment tomorrow for the surgery to happen on Monday. Would you stand with me as we do this? Let's believe God for that child, Lord, in your mighty name. We pray for JoJo, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, over this appointment tomorrow. I know even now, Lord, they're traveling to, to Cincinnati. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the authority of your word and the power in the name of Jesus, 
You are able, God, right now, Lord, to touch that child. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let your hand be upon Miranda. Let your hand be upon sister, brother and sister Hurley. And, Lord, let this appointment tomorrow, Lord, go in their favor. Give them favor in the name of the Lord Jesus. And, God, you strengthen them for this. In the name of the Lord, God, we claim a report of faith. We claim a report of healing. We claim a report of miracle. We claim a report. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we declare your healing even right now. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now somebody shout with a shout of faith. Somebody shout with a shout of faith. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Oh, that's it. Go ahead. Let out your faith right now. Let there be a release of faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, you see what happens when you start releasing faith? The atmosphere changes. When you start releasing faith, all of a sudden, there's a, swift, a move in the spirit. And God is getting in place to do something impossible, something supernatural. God is getting ready. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody say it with faith. I believe it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Anybody glad to have the Bryans whip back with us? Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. The Bryans are a club favorite. Church favorite, I'm sorry. They are a church favorite. And... Uh, this is what a revival that we look to from the end of that revival next, last year to the beginning this year. We look forward to this time with them, and we're so thankful that they are able to be here and to minister to us. And they have come. They now we're going to visit, and we're going to have fun, and we're going to enjoy the fellowship of uh, the Bryan family and and all of that. But ultimately, they have come to do the work of the Lord. They have come to do the work of God uh, in this service and uh, to our church and congregation. And I told him in the office, as I've told him many times before, I said, it said you have your liberty in this pulpit. And uh, you, you have your freedom in this pulpit to minister to this church. There's no strings. I've, I've got tremendous faith in this family. And, and Brother Brian, and I put no strings on them. I put no limitations, never have, never have put any limitations on them. Because I want him, I want him to have freedom to do what God tells him to do in Jesus' name. Anybody else believe that's what we should do? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's some preachers I put, I put strings on them. But that's another story for another time. But I'm going to bring him to this pulpit. And you've released faith over the last few minutes. Let's continue to exercise that faith with an anticipation. Now, Brother Brian, Brother Brian's going to minister, but God's going to do the work. God is going to do the work. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Brian, we love you. God bless you. Come to this pulpit in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let's clap our hands to the Lord tonight. Thank you again for uh, the 
always the warm family welcome, and we're so grateful to have all of the family here. Uh, even Jody is here. So, two two things you need for revival: Jesus and Jody. So uh, grateful that uh, she's able to be with us tonight, and we're just so thankful to be together again. I feel like maybe I ought to sing that old Buck Owens song, Together Again, uh, but so grateful to be together in the presence of the Lord, and to sense what He was doing while we were praying, the faith of God, you can just feel it tangibly in the house reminded me we were in a meeting a few years ago and one of the ministers, his sister, was with child and um, we had been there for a few nights for ministry but the, his sister had been, she was pretty far along but there was a situation with the child and as the situation developed over a day or so, Basically, they went to the doctors and there was no heartbeat. And so they, were, they rushed her to the emergency room as we were starting church service and said they have to take this baby. And so they asked, would the church pray? But we just felt a special moment that God wanted to intervene. So everybody in the building prayed like we did a minute ago. And I asked the brothers, what, what direction is the hospital? Let's just stretch our hands in that direction. And we spoke the life, the resurrection power of God onto that precious child and on the mother. The short of the story is two things. First of all, the power of God was as palpable as it is tonight while we were praying. The second thing is that child is old enough to have won the last five years as a national uh, in the Bible quizzing. So, I'm telling you that when we're praying and we're releasing faith in this situation, something has already gone out from this house and begun a miraculous work. Aren't you thankful? The touch of God. The touch of God. Let's thank Him right now for it. Let's thank Him for what he's doing. That's all right. Come on, let's take a moment and thank him. Blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Genesis chapter 2. And as we, for this annual revival and, and just time to celebrate, to focus, to recalibrate our faith as we push toward, not just toward Sunday, but toward the things that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that through the Spirit of the Lord, through the Word of the Lord, we will be uh, reawakened, empowered to access the faith of God in our lives. Genesis chapter 2, a couple of verses. First of all, verse number 7. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth. Real simple, nothing glorious, just dust formed us out of it. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Move down to verse number 15. This is what he did in a little more detail. God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded him, saying, Out of every tree in the garden you can freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat of it. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. He formed him out of the dust. And in a little bit more detail, part of the creative process was it was not good for man or individual or humanity to try to handle things on their own. He built them, he built us to need help because he knew we'd be some broken folk. And isn't it wonderful to know that he has not only prepared help for us, 
But he planned on us being needy. He planned on you being a mess at least one point in your life. Thank you, Lord, for your word, the power of it to perform in this house and in our lives tonight. Make it easy for us to hear, to understand what your spirit is saying. And let there be a release from your throne room into our lives tonight. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you're about to do. And somebody shout in Jesus' name and clap your hands to the Lord. You, you may be seated for a moment. It, it, it is a very well-known tactic of the adversary, especially in the time in which we live, to get us to be so overwhelmed and then so internalized that we immediately implode emotionally on ourselves as we're trying to navigate the daily realities of life. We have become, along with the enemy, our own worst enemy. And we can mentally sabotage, and it becomes our conversation, and we sabotage divine potential. So with the help of the Lord tonight, we move from despair to deliverance by His Word. Are you ready tonight to move toward the miraculous of God? First of all, to repeat what we've just read, God made us to need help. Because we do not, and some of y'all know it all, so are not going to like this. But we don't have it all together. Or at least here's one example. We do not have it all together. God planned on that we would not have it all together so that he could put us together. As a matter of fact, when he made us, part of the makeup or the work of God in the garden was that he made us to need or to ask for help and said, I will give him a helpmeet. I will prepare a help meet for him. And that's not just a reference to uh, God making a woman or the building of what would eventually be known from that moment as the marriage covenant or the bringing together of man and woman. But ultimately, God creating us to need help created a space or a vacuum, as it were, where the great helper through the power of the Holy Ghost would have a place to work in our lives. He made us to have a need for Him. He created us to have a need to call upon Him and a need for His help because God knew we couldn't figure it out all by ourselves. And it's amazing how uh, the human ego influenced by the, the spirit of this world and the God of this world, we like to suffer alone. We like to complain alone. We refuse to ask for help. I know I'm not talking about anyone in this building, but just in case one of your friends hears about it, you can share it and pass it along. We refuse to ask for help, but God set a precedent in everything that He did. And God was the first one to initiate a question when He asked Adam, where are you? Not that he couldn't find Adam, but he was setting the pace. You need to seek help. You need to ask for help. You need to call upon the Lord. Paul, the apostle, would later refer to it in the New Testament and said, if there's any sick among you, let him call, let him ask, let him beckon, let him make the divine connection. But we refuse to ask for help because we make the assumption, first of all, that we must be beyond God's help, otherwise he never would have allowed this to happen or we're probably too far along to ask for help. But God taught us to ask him for help from the very beginning. Maybe you recall the story of Israel's deliverance from the captivity of Egypt and on the night of the great Passover and commemoration of that night. Every generation thereafter... The children were to sit at the table with, with the parents and ask the question at the beginning of the Paschal meal, why is this night different than any other night around us? It was God preparing them and helping them to understand that we have need and if we ask Him, He will fulfill that need because we're not the only ones going through what we're going through. And sometimes... We get caught up in mental battles or physical battles and the enemy and ourselves corner us and intimidate us to the point that 
we feel like there is no rescue and there is no help and therefore our faith is not exercised. But I'm here to speak into the atmosphere of your life and into this house for the next few days and release a word tonight that would help us to begin to access supernatural on the next level. Do you all remember the story of Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and began to ask questions? It's another example of what happens when you begin to engage God and begin to make the connections. Nicodemus got to thinking he was the only one that was in his particular uh, dilemma. So he came to Jesus by night and began to ask, and did Jesus answer him? Indeed, he did. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, as the church age unfolds, he was enough to set an example again of asking questions when the Jews stood by as the power of the Holy Ghost fell from heaven and they began to ask, what does this mean? What, what is falling from heaven? What is this unfolding of Joel's prophecy among us? I hope tonight that God would help us to be bold enough to ask for His help and receive His help. Now, my wife and I, when we got married and we began to travel around the country, one of the first things that uh, saved our marriage was the engagement of the GPS. Because fellas, believe it or not, you don't know where you're going. We, we have, the guys get to thinking we have an internal compass. I can feel it. We're supposed to turn left in three miles. How do you know? I just, I can tell you, by the way, that the sun's leaning against that hill over yonder there. It's, and, and then drive around for eight hours on a 20-minute trip because you won't ask for help. But God helping us tonight because some of y'all have been walking around with emotional dilemmas, physical dilemmas, and you're afraid to ask for help because you don't want to feel like, well, I'm the only one or nobody will understand what I'm going through. So you remain in prison. But God is going to release tonight. Turn to somebody and say, you're not alone. Not alone in what you think. You're not alone in what you suffer. You're not alone in what you fear. You, you, you get to thinking these things about yourself. Well, nobody, I'm sure no one else fears what I fear. I'm sure nobody else is thinking what I'm thinking. I know, I'm sure that nobody else has gone through what I've gone through. I'm, I'm reminded in the book of Genesis chapter 28 when the Bible said the great patriarch Jacob was, was traveling and he was actually on a journey from some of his fears. But while he was journeying, the Bible says that the night fell upon him and he had to make a camp that night because darkness fell upon him. That was the same night that he had a dream that there was a ladder set up from the heavens and God was at the top. Say it with me, God was there. But Jacob missed the whole thing and he missed the whole thing because he was so caught up in himself. He was so caught up in his own fears. He was probably thinking like we do. I've messed it up. Nobody's messed it up as bad as I have. And you can imagine what's going on in his head. Meanwhile, the heavens are there. There's a connection to the heavens and he awakes the next day to find that he missed the whole thing. The, the terror tonight is the possibility you could walk out of here without a touch from God. You could walk out of here without deliverance. You could walk out of here without access to the miraculous simply because you have imploded upon yourself and the enemy's got you thinking nobody's going through what I'm going through and I'm probably not going to make it but I'm here to tell you tonight somebody else has made it through what you're going through and they've made it through somebody else has lived long enough to tell the story and if they can make it you can make it this, this book we call the holy text of God, the Bible is full of stories that the Bible says were written for our admonition, our encouragement, our instruction. If he can do it for them, he can do it for me. Maybe that's all your enemy needs to hear. When you walk into a prayer room as if God can do it to three Hebrew boys that don't have a clue what they're doing. He can do it for me. Maybe all you need to do is say, if God can do it for Jairus' daughter, then he can do it for one of my children. Maybe that's all you need is to begin to rehearse the reality of God. If he can do it for somebody else, he can do it for me. 
Jacob got so caught up in himself, he missed God. The amazing thing is, in the book of Psalm, chapter 74, matter of fact, someone turn there because I, I want you to see the, the, what happens mentally, emotionally, when we begin to believe the lies of the adversary. Look at Psalm 74 and verse 16. And somebody just read that out. It's, as a matter of fact, it's up on the screen. You can just holler it out if you hadn't already. What does it say? Oh, wait a minute. The day belongs to you, God. The good times belong to you. The brightness of the sun belongs to you. What else belongs to you? The night belongs to you. So wait a minute, Jacob. You've taken possession of something that belongs to God. Jacob, you, you've gotten caught in, in sundown and you're so imploded upon yourself emotionally and mentally. You've taken the possession of something that belongs to God. So you've come nowhere near asking for help. You've missed a divine interaction. When the Bible says the whole time the day belongs to him and the night belongs to him also. I'm here to tell you today the enemy cannot have your victories and the enemy can also not have your troubles. The Bible says it rains on the just and on the unjust. But God will never leave us nor forsake us. God has promised to be with us all the way. Now we've got battles that we fight. Whether they're physical, mental, emotional, moral, whatever. And you think about, I'm going to walk out of this service tonight expecting to return to my place of suffering all by myself because the preacher, he don't understand what I'm going through. And, and, and so and so, they, they don't know how hard it's been in my house. But somehow, by the grace of God, you're going to make it. Somehow, by the grace of God, you're going to come out of the cave you've been dwelling in and understand God is going to move me from despair into victory. There's not a greater victory that could be told in biblical and world history then the story of the prophet Elijah and the great things that he saw in one day. The defeat of 450 prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. It was epic. It sent shockwaves and was in the headlines all over the land. It also awakened the controlling spirit of one whose name was Jezebel. And her work is so telling because she sought to minimize the great thing that God did through the prophet Elijah. And that's exactly what she does when she sees somehow someone might rise up out from the ruin. She will pursue them and she will intimidate them. And through isolation and intimidation, the word of Jezebel got to Elijah. And basically the word was, you tell him he ain't going to live long enough to see the victory and have any kind of a celebration. It was a word so heavy. That without any type of movement, the word pushed him into a corner. Pushed him. And her incessant pursuant of him sent him into a cave of isolation. It was words at that point. That's all it was, was words. But in his mind, he was as good as dead. And there he sat in this cave. While the enemy was destroying him from within. Destroying the great prophet Elijah. How? Get him alone. Isolate him. And make him think he's the only one going through what he's going through. And suddenly all the great things that God has done or that God would do are at the mercy of this little uh, mechanism between his ears. His mind begins to become his greatest adversary. And so there he was. Just after a great victory became defeated. And there he sat under a tree in the wilderness convinced that Jezebel had already caught him, convinced the haters had already caught him. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm better off dead. God came to him and God said to the prophet in 1 Kings chapter 19, What are you doing here? What a question. And what a powerful question. It seems like a general question that he'd ask any passerby, but it's not a general question. God's asking the prophet, God's asking the mighty in person of God. He's asking someone that he had already intended greatness. He's asking someone like he'd ask you and I because all of us were born with divine potential. You ought to tell somebody sitting next to you, God has big plans for me. 
God has big plans for you. And God had big plans for Elijah. But there Elijah sat imploding upon himself. And God said, you of all people, what are you doing here? You of all people who I have destroyed the prophets of Baal and brought fire from a wet altar of all people. I delivered you from drugs. I delivered you from a life of destruction. You've seen me raise up other family folk. You of all people ought not to be sitting there on a Thursday night acting like I've never done nothing and like it's all. uh, What are you doing here? How, How have you somehow become this? I can hear God asking people. I can hear God asking churches. I can hear God asking situations of all people of all time. How did you end up like this? How did you end up believing the work of the adversary? And he told he said, I'm, I'm as good as dead. And I'm the only one, poor little old me. I'm the only one been through what I've gone through. I'm the only one suffering. And God said, Will you wait just a minute. I have seven other prophets who have not caved into the prophet Baal or all the junk the world's been talking. You are not the only one. I've got others that have made it. I've got others that have stood up. I've got others that somehow just got back up. And if they can do it, you can do it too. That was God's word to the prophet. You're not the only one. Don't sit there and think, oh, we're just a little old church on Thursday night. And we're just barely getting by God. So you wait just a minute. I made revivals out of four little old ladies in the middle of a desert. If I can do it there, I can do it here. You wait just a minute. You don't have to sit there and allow yourself. I wish I could get somebody right now to say, I'm not, it doesn't end for me like this. It's, I'm just getting started. You you think about it. You think about the great things that God has determined to do. I'm not preaching to you trying to get you to hope that he might do. I'm telling you, God has plans to do it. So you need to walk into your prayer closet tomorrow or whatever it is you do in the morning and say I don't know what just point in the mirror at your enemy and say what are you doing here why why you been sitting believing all this stuff I'm moving from despair into deliverance I'm moving into next dimension stuff I'm not the only one I've shared uh, some of my life history I mean, we're family, so I've had to share that from time to time. And I'm not proud of some of the folk that I'm supposedly related to. And not proud of uh, of some of the things that they've done. Or not proud of some of the things that they have done to me. And have every right, emotionally, physically, mentally, to live my life out with even a portion of victim mentality so that I could garner the support and pity of others but a few years ago the spirit of the Lord and I had an encounter and he changed the way that I think so that I wouldn't have to think like a victim so that I wouldn't have to look at myself as a statistic and I remember the prayer meeting so well and I arose from that prayer meeting and said wait a minute other testimonies have gotten me out of what I have come out of. And other people have been abused and other people have been lied to and other people come from jacked up houses and they made it and if they can make it, I can make it. I'm not going to believe destruction. And, and some you, you got to, when you pray, you don't just ask God to help. You are the voice of God. When you pray, you got the voice of God working in simultaneous operation with your voice. You are prophesying to the atmosphere. Don't sit there and act like it's a one-way conversation where you're trying to wake him up and get his help. You are in conversation with him. You are in unison with him. And everything that you're praying becomes prophecy into the atmosphere and conversation into the atmosphere. You need to start praying like that and say, if God can do it in other little towns he can do it in my little town if God can do it in somebody else's body he can do it in my body I told the story we were Zeke and I uh, were at a service a few months ago and I was trying to help people's faith and I told the story of a guy that we met a few years ago 
His name was John. I called him Big Bad John because he was ornery. And he, he was, well, he was just ornery. And he was a guy that, like, he finally came to church and it, good to meet you, preacher, but he wouldn't shake your hand. I, really, I don't do handshaking, don't do any of that. By the way, when you're praying, don't touch me. I don't need nobody to touch me. So we're like, okay. Seemed like a friendly feller. And uh, so he came. But then, so then he told his wife, I might come back next week. Like, we're all supposed to go, ooh, hope so. You know, I might come back. Might. And so we had a Saturday night prayer meeting. And I said to his wife, you know what? He, he, she said, he's just so stubborn. He's just got to be in control. I said, darling, he is not in control. He's fighting for control, but he's not in control. You pick where he'd like to, you'd like him to stand when he prays through. You pick out the spot in the altar. I was telling this story. She picked out the spot. He came to church the next day, came out, stood in that spot, and the Lord laid him out like he ought to. And there he cried, and there he spoke in tongues. I told the story, and this sis was there, and we were, it was a miracle service. And I told this story, and here she come walking up. We were doing two things. We were uh, raising funds. There was a situation in the church, and so we were raising funds, and we had raised this, this miraculous amount of money, and it was a relatively small church. And then we came up, uh, it was an odd number. I'm odd, and I don't like odd numbers. So I said, Would you, we need somebody to make up the difference. Would you, somebody, and, and I said, maybe what you'd like to do is give an offering in the seed of faith that this is for. So here she come walking up, and she said, Brother Brian, you just told that story about that guy. I'm going to stand right here for my backslidden son. She said, I wrote a check, and God's going to bring him in. She said, my husband and I have cried over him and wept over him. He ran off and got on drugs and did all this stuff and have blamed ourselves. And she said, that stops today. And so she put her offering in and she rejoiced standing right there in the altar. And then next week we were somewhere else in the country and the pastor of the church called. He got, it, got me on the phone. He said, bro, you're going to love this. So he said, in the altar right now is that sis standing next to her boy who has prayed through to the Holy Ghost. And she said, she's standing there praying. She told me, said, Brother Brian, I've heard of God doing it in other people. She said, i got to admit, it seems a little bit odd to me. But I've heard of God doing it in other people. If God can do it for them, He can do it for my son. And God did it. And that same God that did it a couple of months ago is still in this house tonight. Great. Anybody that believes that, you ought to shout to Him and thank Him. What are you doing here? I'm the only one. No, you ain't. I've got 7,000 others. You ain't the only church that's been through a season where it looks like nothing's happening. I've got thousands of other churches that have, but they broke out in revival just the same. Oh, somebody ought to shout to the Lord on this Thursday night. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> you, you, we, we cannot fathom what the first century church went through that first wave of persecution watching them as they would tie their children up and drag them through the street until the flesh was torn off their bodies watch them while they'd be hung upside down and cut in half tortured Publicly, we cannot fathom what these men and women have seen in in the time of the first century church. The words, the hate, the torture. Now we see examples of it in modern times and other shades of it in modern time. But imagine being one of the first. And the apostle wrote a letter to them and said, "Seeing how we are compassed and surrounded." By such a great cloud of 
witnesses and others that have gone before us, others who have been through what we've been through, lay off everything and every weight and sin that does easily beset and entangles you and run the race. Get up. Somebody else got up. You can get up too. And with patience and with perseverance, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross if he did it, and I've got him living in me somehow. I can do it by the grace of God. Sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured all things. First Peter chapter 5. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So that he could lift you up in due time. Because he's promised, brother. He's promised, sister, to lift you up. Cast all of your care upon him. For he cares for you. And one version says, be self-controlled. Wake up. The adversary is like a roaring lion looking to devour someone. But resist him. Stand strong in your faith because you need to know that others in other parts of the world are going through the same thing that you're going through. And somehow they've made it. Others have been strengthened. Others have been delivered. Others have been healed. Others, God has brought revival to others. And if he'll do it there, he'll do it here. And if he'll do it with them, he'll do it with you. And if he'll do it then, he'll do it now. Somebody just rejoice in the Lord. Somebody lift your voice to him. Hallelujah. God, what you've done in other times. God, what you've done for other people, you can do for me. It seemed like an isolated event. They took the Roman soldiers, the misunderstanding Jews and Pharisees, leaders, they took these 12 fishermen, these 12 societal no-counts, they took their leader, they beat him and they bludgeoned him and they prosecuted him and persecuted him and tortured him, killed him. And it would appear to be over. And at the final moments of the life of Christ, Matthew said in chapter 27, he cried, Finally, and breathed his last breath. And at that time, the veil in the temple was torn top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were falling off from the mountains. And graves were opened. And many of the body of the saints who were sleeping got up and they came out of the graves some after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many it would seem like an isolated incident where it is supposed that one prophet who they claim breathed his final breath and raised back to life if it wasn't for the fact that it wasn't the only thing that happened in that town like that. And he wasn't the only one that experienced resurrection, but others also who lie either beyond the point of death or at the point of death, and God raised them up so as to make many statements, but probably one of the most powerful statements, and that is simply this. 
If I can do it for them, I can do it for you. And what I have to accomplish in my people is not some event that you can just close off and isolate somewhere. But the statement is made. Others have trials. You'll have trials. But others resurrected. You will resurrect also. Even from the point of impossibility. And God's resurrection power makes that statement again to the New Testament church when he said, If the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, child of God, it will quicken your mortal body. Yes, troubles will happen and come to all, but so will victory. Yes, troubles and trials will come by the multiplied number, but so will revival. So will awakening. So will deliverance. If God can do it for them, He can do it for us. And I believe tonight that same power that same deliverance resurrection force is alive and well in this sanctuary and is alive and well and tangible to us in this season of revival i wonder if tonight for the next few moments stand with me and i want you to join me in this altar area and we are going to pray not just talk to god but we are going to pray and speak into our lives. Maybe some of you got some things mentally, emotionally, physically you've been going through. Bring them into this altar area. We're going to pray with one another. But we're going to prophesy into the atmosphere. Our prayers become the voice of God. Speak it into the atmosphere. And if God can do it for other places, God... We're asking you to do it right here in Ravenswood. We're asking you to do it right here among our families. If you can do it for them, surely you can do it for us. With your hands lifted, with your voices lifted, would you begin to pray right now? Lord, we thank you for this book, this historical record of stories whose lives and people that you've delivered, that you've raised them up, that you've strengthened them, that you've caused them to be conquerors. And God, tonight, we rehearse that not just to strengthen our faith, but to believe that you have prepared and promised to do some powerful things in our midst this week. Lord, tonight we dismiss fear. We dismiss doubt. We dismiss the bad report, the negative, the constant negative conflict we dismiss it lord and we speak your wonder working power tonight into this house i'm asking lord that you'll touch my neighbor the person that i'm standing next to i'm asking god that you will just transmit that wonder working power to them that you'll transmit revival into their household that you'll transmit revival into their life That's it. While you're reaching out to pray with somebody else, why don't you be a conduit? Why don't you be a a connect point for the power of heaven flowing? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm calling on you tonight. I'm calling on you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's family being restored. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's been praying. And whoever they've been praying for, you're going to give them deliverance. Oh, thank you, Lord. Come on, let's lift our voices up. Let's lift our voices up until we... We reach a point of rejoicing. We reach a point of thankfulness.